When we talk about money, you hear all the time that there's a certain amount of money that's needed in the economy, they need to expand the money supply, they need to keep interest rates low. And uh, we've seen a lot of this in the last few years since the meltdown on Wall Street. And uh, that's really what I want to talk about today, how well that's worked out or not worked out is the case. But <clears throat> the first thing I want to talk about is used to be uh, money wasn't, uh, you know, the kind of paper that we see uh, printed today um, or digits that we see on a screen. It used to be mined. Uh, it used to be silver and it used to be gold and it used to be very uh, substantial. It, looks, it used to look something like this that I have in my hand. This is uh, an ounce of gold, uh, American Eagle. Uh, and I'm sure you've all held little gold in your hand, right? Everybody has? Anybody has it? No, you all have. It's very heavy. Um, and, uh, you know, modern coins, when you drop them, don't sound like that, do they? They sound like you're dropping one, a button or a piece of plastic or something like that. Um, as you can tell, uh, just by when I drop this, that it takes considerable resources to create this, right? Um, it takes uh, moving tons and tons and tons of dirt and, uh, and then a refining process and a minting process and uh, by the time you make uh, one of these coins, uh, you have considerable resources in it. So you wouldn't make money by mining gold unless it was worthwhile to do so. The cost of the mining would, uh, would have to be less than the actual uh, value of the coin on the, on the marketplace. And so that's, uh, you know, that's the advantage of gold and gold and silver. Uh, being on the marketplace. Now, um, if you're going to counterfeit, if you want to get into the counterfeiting business, you would try to recreate this, but using lesser materials, right? You, you try to uh, give it a gold finish and maybe put, I don't know, some lead or something heavy because a gold coin's heavy. Doesn't look like it should be, but it's it's got some some weight and some density to it. And so uh, that's, that's what you would do if you were going to counterfeit. But of course, counterfeit is fraud. If you tried to pass off a gold coin, but you made it with brass, or you made it with copper, or you made it with lead, uh, that would be fraud. And counterfeiting is, uh, exactly, is, a, is exactly that. Well. And if you want to go to jail, for sure, I mean, you just absolutely are just dying to go to jail, uh, you should get in the counterfeiting business because the government uh, will apprehend uh, counterfeiters and they will bring you to justice. And why is that? Well, they don't like competition because government is the biggest counterfeiter that we have. Um, now, I wanted to point out that um, on this coin, this one ounce coin, uh, it says $50. Um, I would tell you to, uh, if you can buy this for $50 anywhere, please do. Uh, please buy uh, all the uh, one ounce uh, eagles for 50 bucks that you can. Um, this says $100. Uh, which do you think costs more to produce? Now this says 100 and this says 50 bucks. Is it a trick question? Nobody has an answer. Oh, the coin costs more, yeah. Which would you rather have? Oh, thank you, all right. We're, we're, on, the, we're on the right track. Um, government can create these for somewhere around four or five cents. In fact, last year they made more of these than they made $1 bills. It's one of the biggest export products that the United States has because a lot of $100 bills get sent overseas. So if you can make these for four or five cents, get $100 worth of product, that's a good business to be in. And I would urge all of you to get in that business if you possibly could. 
but you will probably will, won't be able to do that. Now, um, but what I wanted to talk to you about today is when um, money is counterfeited or created by the government, it's not uh, done by way of just, you know, they increase the money supply, they don't, they don't print up a bunch of these, you know, $100 bills, make bales of them, put them out at the corner here of Magnolia and Donahue, and let people come and get them, you know, first come, first serve. Uh, ben Bernanke, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, uh, does not fly over with a helicopter and let them sprinkle it down so that if you were in the right place at the right time, you could grab as, as much money as they're creating. That's not the way money is created. In, um, in modern uh, banking, modern central banking. It is created through the commercial banking system, uh, through the loan market. And it's created primarily on, on Wall Street. And that's a fairly complicated uh, sort of process uh, that uh, I don't want to go into today. But if you do want to learn about that, uh, Murray Rothbard has written a wonderful book called The Mystery of Banking. Uh, where he explains it very clearly that uh, how money is created through the commercial banking system. And, um, but the point is, through the commercial banking system, with the help of the Federal Reserve, it's not banks by themselves that can do this. They need the help of the Federal Reserve. But because that's the way money is created, it's not sprinkled from the sky like a snowstorm, because it is created through the banking system, some people get the money first, and some people get it last. And in fact, that's how Murray Rothbard explained inflation. He said it's a race to get the money first, as opposed to getting less, last. Because, uh, because counterfeiters benefit first. And who is the number one counterfeiter? The government, yes. So they benefit uh, first. And who, uh, who, is the, who are the big losers in this? Well, the big losers are, of course, the people, on, normal people, people that uh, work on a salary, for instance, uh, people who draw a pension, um, people who have entry-level jobs, um, anybody on some kind of government assistance uh, are typically losers in this uh, process. Uh, but the winners, government, and those who get cheap money very quickly. And that's, uh, that's really what I wanted to talk about today. But it's interesting that, you know, we hear all about this Occupy uh, Wall Street uh, movement. You've probably seen the, you know, some of the tape on TV uh, down on uh, the park there in uh, New York and around the country where we've got a, a you know, uh, these people who are, uh, you know, protesting. I'm, we're not sure what they're protesting, really. Um, used to be we had protests about, you know, that uh, protesters wanted peace on earth and things like that. Well, it seems like uh, uh, now uh, these, these folks are just protesting uh, either to protest or that they'd all like an iPad or something like that. They'd all, they'd all like to, uh, you know, get theirs. So they, they went to college and they racked up a bunch of student debt and now they can't get a job and they think that's unfair. And that's really um, what uh, Occupy Wall Street's all about. I'll tell you how confused it was. I saw a little tape of it yesterday where, uh, <clears throat> because what's interesting is the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement has split into two camps. And you have one camp with the poor people, you know, the poor rung of people who are protesting. And then you have the other camp that is the, you know, the college educated and supposedly wealthier part. And they've actually split into two camps. They're not all one big happy family. The rich guys don't want to go down with the poor guys, and the poor guys don't want to go up where the rich guys are. So they asked one of the rich guys who was holding his iPad too, and they said, um, listen, are you willing to share your iPad 
with the guys down uh, at the poorer end of the park. And he goes, well, no. But I think everyone in the country and everyone who's protesting should have access to technology. They should all have access. And so the interviewer says, well, but you don't want to let them use your technology. He goes, no. No, this is mine. This is personal property. I'm against private property, but this is my personal property. <laughs> So, you know, if you're wondering about the confusion out there about what is being talked about or what is being protested in the Occupy Wall Street movement, I don't think that uh, illustrates it any better. Although I guess in some kind of Marxian theory, private property refers to the uh, means of production, and there's a distinction between that, which the Marxians hate, and uh, actual personal property, which is your, like your stuff, and uh, that's okay. But I digress. What I wanted to talk about is what happened since 2008 and who gets the money first. Because you remember in 2008, the financial markets were imploding. Everybody thought it was going to be the end of the world. Um, you know, Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy. Uh, Merrill Lynch, they used to be bullish on America. You remember, if you're old enough to see those commercials, they fell into the hands of uh, Bank of America. Uh, AIG, which was a big uh, insurance company, um, they had to uh, take their tin cup to, uh, over to the Treasury and ask for $40 billion to, to be bailed out. And so, uh, at, at that point, it was uh, I, I want, our money supply, our M2 money supply, was an unadjusted 7.8 trillion dollars with a T, and that's when Ben Bernanke and Tim Geithner and Henry Paulson—they were all working weekends. This has been portrayed in a couple of movies to patch up their friends on on uh, Wall Street. And but you know, Main Street wasn't that bad at the time, if you remember. Uh, unemployment was 6.1 percent. Of course, that means you uh, believe the government when they tell you these things. Um, even though there had been a lot of jobs lost, um, their uh, the unemployment wasn't too bad. Home values had only fallen about 7 percent, uh, but very few were underwater. So things weren't too bad. But the Fed wasn't worried about Main Street. They were worried about their friends on Wall Street. And so the Fed's balance sheet went from 927 billion with a B on October 1st, or that was at September 10th, and 20 days later it had grown to 1.5 trillion dollars. And if you remember, as I started this, money is created with the help of the Federal Reserve. And the Federal Reserve, the bigger their balance sheet, the more money they can create. The more money they can create in them out of nowhere. The more of these they can create very quickly. They can't create these, they can create the paper variety. So 1.5 trillion on October 1st, by New Year's Eve, they had grown their balance sheet to 2.2 trillion. This was all so that you and I could go to an ATM machine and be sure that our, we could put in our card and get out our money. That's what they told us. In fact, it worked out so well that Ben Bernanke, everybody know who Ben Bernanke is? Yes, everybody's nodding. He's still doodling. Um, the, uh, <laughs> uh, ben Bernanke was named Times Person of the Year. It was Person of the Year for providing the creative leadership that helped ensure that 2009 was a period of weak recovery rather than catastrophic depression. So here we are two years later, and we still have weakness that uh, he gave us, and it will continue indefinitely, it appears. So I'm not sure what time was wishing for, but they're certainly getting uh, the weakness that, uh, that Bernanke created. So anyway, what's happened to money supply since those dark days of 2008? They are now 9.2 trillion. You remember we started uh, uh, just three years earlier at 7.8, and uh, 
And uh, so it's grown uh, a tremendous amount. And uh, uh, essentially 1.6 trillion, somewhere in that range, 1.6, 1.7 trillion. And the money aggregates are now growing at 20%. So we have this huge, huge uh, increase in the money supply. In fact, if you want to think of it a different way, uh, because when, you, when I say, well, it went from 7.8 to 9.2, you kind of go, well, that's, that's kind of a big change. But think of it this way. The total money supply in 1981, September of 1981, was the difference that it's just grown in the last three years. Total money supply was just equal to the increase we've had in the last three years. That's how much money has been created in the last three years. And when that money is created, the money in all of your pockets has become worth less. That is counterfeiting, counterfeiting on stilts. Now, who benefits from this? Why is it? There's no outrage. There's no marching in the streets. We've already talked about Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street isn't uh, <laughs> terribly worried about the money supply. Uh, why, why aren't people... Um, uh, this seems like universally almost uh, everybody uh, is harmed by this, but there's a certain group of people that benefit by who gets the money first. And we've already talked that government benefits for sure because they can pay for the things that they want to do, whether it's wars around the world or whether it's programs here that they don't have to overtly tax you for. They can just create money and pay for this. It's silent tax, if you will. But Jim Grant, who writes a wonderful publication called Grant's Interest Rate Observer, it's very expensive, but it's, it's quite worth it if, if you can afford it. But he wrote recently, actually he told the Wall Street Journal recently, he said that fiat dollar is an elite system. And Wall Street is its supporting interest group. Those nimble, market-savvy, plugged-in folks know how to shuffle assets and exploit cheap funding from the Fed to lever up their profits and soften the downside. So while government benefits at the same time, Wall Street benefits. And you can see it in stock prices. In March of 2009, the S&P hit a low, it's 666, and it's more than doubled since that time. So the new money came rushing in, and it came into stock prices. In fact, Wall Street loves inflation. Wall Street paid out 27.6 billion in bonuses in 2009, 20.8 billion last year. Uh, mergers and acquisitions are on fire. Uh, in fact, the demand for trophy office buildings is very strong. Um, the market for farmland in Iowa is very strong. So we can always say that uh, real estate investors, stock investors, uh, Wall Street always like, um, like inflation. In fact, this goes back uh, for many, many years, many, many centuries. Uh, Mark Thornton mentioned a, an economist named Richard Cantillon. Well, he wasn't just an economist. He was actually a speculator. And during John Law's Mississippi bubble, which occurred... 1718 to 1720. John Law was a Keynesian before Keynes was even born. He had the idea that France's economy could be fixed if you just print more money. And it's an idea that um, has held on for centuries and centuries. So John Law created all this money, and then he also created shares of a a company called the Mississippi Company. Speculators like Richard Candion knew that all this money would probably go into shares of the Mississippi Company. And those shares did rise 20-fold, 20-fold. And then they crashed. Well, Cantillon was able to cash out. He's one of the first to cash out before they crashed. So Cantillon was not only a smart economist, good writer, he was a great speculator. And that's who wins in inflations like this. At the same time, what were happening to the French people? Well, price inflation was rampant. 
Prices went up 25 times just in a few months. Uh, and in fact, the price of uh, food items like bread uh, went up as much as three or 400%. So while Can uh, Cantillon, John Law, and the King of France were getting rich, the average, piece, uh, average people were uh, suffering under inflation of higher prices, price inflation. World War I, after World War I, there's a period in Germany called Weimar Germany. And they had a terrible inflation also. And uh, one of the writers about Weimar Germany, an uh, uh, author called Wettig, Bernard Wettig, wrote that all those in debt, all those who knew how to speculate in the stock exchange, and all those who possessed foreign currency could transfer money into material assets and had a good chance of profiting by inflation. That's who made out during the inflation in Weimar, Germany. In fact, the German stock market stood at 97 in January of 1990, 1919. And by December of 1922, three years later, it was 89.81. That means the stock market in Germany during this hyperinflation went up 89 times. Now you might think, well, that was a pretty good place to be. Well, you were better off moving your money from marks to dollars because the dollar index went up 1,525 times, or you were better in putting your money in coal, which went up 1,250 times. But who benefited? Who benefited in Weimar, Germany? Well, it was the government. The government's debt, which was huge at that time, virtually was wiped out through the inflation. All those people that bought those German bonds were left with getting essentially nothing after that inflation. They were the biggest, biggest winners in that inflation. Now, there were a few big businessmen in Germany who also benefited uh, because little firms got in trouble. Big firms were able to get cheap money and buy them out, and they also benefited uh, at the same time. Same thing happened in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe is uh, a fairly recent in, uh, phenomenon. This happened in the late 90s to early 2000, mid 2000s. Um, and, uh, you know, they created uh, uh, huge amounts of money in that country. Um, and, uh, in fact, uh, first, they had to come up with this bill that's uh, $50 trillion. It's a $50 trillion bill. Um, very attractive bill. Uh, and says, I promise to pay the bear on demand $50 trillion. Um, now, this is $50 trillion. Which would you rather have? <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. Eventually, $50 trillion wasn't enough. And they started printing hundred trillion dollar notes, which we had the overhead working. But then again, and this is an attractive. Uh, we have three rocks that are balanced here, and picture of a um, ox and Victoria Falls. Very attractive bill. And uh, again, I promise to pay uh, on demand one hundred trillion dollars. And uh, this is from this is from two thousand and eight. Uh, eventually, the, uh, the uh, Zimbabwe dollar crashed. It uh, wasn't worth anything, uh, but I think you can buy these now for, uh, as a, uh, just as a curiosity for 5 or $10 dollars um, on eBay, actually. But in 2007, as uh, inflation roared ahead in Zimbabwe, uh, the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange uh, was the best performing stock exchange in the world. The key Zimbabwe Industrial Index was up 595% just in the beginning, the first part of the, uh, the year. And actually, uh, at a point in 2007, for the previous 12 months, the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange was up 12,000%. Uh, this jump in the share prices is far in excess of the increases in consumer prices, while the country is crumbling, the Zimbabwe stock 
Speculator is keeping up much better than the typical Zimbabwean on the street. So again, in the case of the uh, hyperinflation in Zimbabwe, stock speculators got the money first, got the money first, and they speculated with it. But it was all closed down. Gideon Gono was the, uh, essentially the Ben Bernanke of, uh, of Zimbabwe, if you will. He ran their central bank, and he uh, shut down the stock exchange. Uh, he said, unless there is more discipline and honor, the exchange will stay closed. Uh, he actually had a study done of the Zimbabwe stock exchange. And the study found um, that the stock market has been traditionally one of the drivers behind Zimbabwe's hyperinflation. So forget about money printing, forget about all that. The cause of the <laughs> Zimbabwe hyperinflation was the stock market. And of course, he had it exactly backwards. Of course, the money was flowing into the stock market because of the inflation, but uh, uh, not, uh, not the other way around. Now here in America, right now, we've had all this money created. Um, and where is it going? Is it going to, if you've got a, a small business, can you go to the bank right now and easily get a loan? No, pretty tough to get a loan right now. But the government is borrowing all kinds of money. Um, and uh, in fact, the banks can't get enough of government paper. They're buying $500 billion worth of treasuries in the last couple of years. That's what banks are taking deposits and doing. They're, they're buying uh, government debt. They're not, uh, they're, not, uh, they're not giving loans to business. And what are prices doing? Well, the government says there's no inflation, very little according to government numbers. But uh, if you look to a guy that I do named John Williams at shadowstats.com, he, uh, according to his figures, and he tracks inflation the way they used to do it, um, and he says that prices are increasing at over 10% a year. So what normal people are doing, uh, getting through all this money is not any benefit, but just higher prices. And of course, is all this money creating any jobs? Supposedly, Ben Bernanke says, we need to lower rates, we need to increase the money supply so that people will start being hired. Well, they're not being hired at all. In fact, um, the government's number says that unemployment is 9%. Uh, if they expand that to include people who've dropped out of the workforce, and are only working part-time who would rather have full-time work, it's 16%. And if you track unemployment the way John Williams does, again, the way it used to be, uh, it's over 20%. So nearly one in four Americans are out of work. Also, uh, you have 46 million people on food stamps. That's one in every 15 people in America is on food stamps. Um, the percentage of very poor rose in 300 out of the 360 largest metropolitan areas in 2010. Uh, last year, uh, 2.6 million more Americans descended into poverty. Um, people who are um, actually, who are just considered poor and not necessarily in poverty um, has increased uh, uh, 15 percent, uh, poverty rate of children has gone up, um, number of people on food stamps again has increased 74 percent since 2007. So we have this huge dichotomy. We've got two economies that have been created in the United States. We've got Washington DC and we have Wall Street and then we have uh, what's going on on Main Street. It was no different in Weimar, Germany. Blue and white collar workers lost a third or two thirds of their income between 1913 and 1922. And um, the biggest losers in the Weimar inflation were those who had saved money and those who depended on the state for their subsistence because the state says they'll take care of you with welfare benefits or certain kind of benefits, 
but they never increase them with the rate of inflation. And the same thing's happening today. After two years of no adjustments for inflation uh, for Social Security recipients, finally next year, uh, Social Security recipients will get a bump of a whopping 3.6% in their Social Security checks. Well, that's at the same time, if you believe John Williams, that prices are going up 10%. So it's people that are on the lower rung of uh, either skill level or of society, depending on government benefits, who get, um, get hurt the most. So my message today is this. I don't want you to ever think that you ever can uh, depend on the government to feed you, put a roof over your head, take care of you because they can't do it by printing money. In fact, they're gonna make you worse off by printing money. They're not going to create a job by just printing, printing money. We can see it today. There's no, there's no jobs being created. They're doing just the opposite. So what they're doing is making a very small portion of the country richer. Those in government, those on Wall Street, those are close to the Federal Reserve. Those people are getting richer, the rest of us are getting poor. So you need to, you need to have, you need to plan ahead, you need to save, and when we say save, not necessarily save these, but maybe save these, and have a skill level to keep up with inflation, and never think that the government is gonna take care of you, because they're gonna do just the opposite. Thank you.